Welcome to the Insurance Brokers Podcast with your host, Sarah Myerskoff. This business podcast is for ambitious brokers determined to grow their business. Our guests are highly experienced industry experts and innovators. This is the place to leverage their success, learn how to break through barriers to growth, and discover a community of support and ideas whilst growing your business. Good afternoon, guys. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Insurance Brokers Podcast. It's not often that I do a four-way chat, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, For those people listening, I'll just give a very quick overview of what we're going to chat about. Adrian Saunders, who is the Commercial Director for Ecclesiastical, and I were at a recent meeting where we were discussing this issue of Uh, presenting the risk to the insurers and whether it's the broker's job to assess, whether it's the underwriter's job to assess. And what it actually came down to was presentation. Uh, So I have got the three regional directors for Ecclesiastical in the room, and we're going to have a very open chat about what absolute bloopers you've seen, what's great, what you'd like more of, and um, yeah, just a bit of chat around that really. So with that in mind, let me introduce or let me ask you to introduce yourselves. Francis, we've just established we have a family connection, sort of, friend family. Uh, <laughs> do you want to introduce your yourself for Yeah, we should, we should keep quiet about that, Sarah. Yeah, I've got, <laughs> hi there. Francis Garrell. I'm the regional director for the North. So we do, we look after brokers um, in the North of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Fabulous. Okay, Aid. You're next up. Afternoon. I'm A. Tate. I'm the regional director for our central and southwest operation. Um, and we effectively look after the Midlands, South Wales, down into uh, Devon and Cornwall. Wonderful. And last but not least, Rob. And I'm Rob Lloyd, and I'm the regional director for London and the South East, the remaining area. And obviously look after brokers from that Kent, Surrey, Sussex, um, all the way up to London, a little bit beyond into that Essex and Suffolk and Norfolk area. So if anybody listening knows either Francis, Aid, or Rob, then uh, do send us a message with any questions that you have for them. Okay, so let's let's have this conversation. Firstly, I've given a broad overview of what we're talking about. Um, have you got any kind of opening comments, Rob? What, where, what do you think about the the, the this issue? Um, well, it's, it's, it's more important than it's ever been. Um, the market is difficult at the moment for brokers. Um, I know that a lot of the risks are not... Um, being embraced by the insurance market, maybe like they were a couple of years ago. Um, so therefore, there's a, a big job on, on the hands of brokers trying to present the risk to um, insurers, but equally get a fair and reasoned response from insurers because it's very easy for insurers at the moment um, to say no to a lot of risks. So this presentation idea is more important than ever. But there's been quite a lot of talk uh, in some of the meetings and, and, and press around this, um, the communication between brokers and insurers not being uh, at, at its best at the moment because of COVID and homeworking and uh, difficult product lines, etc. What What do you think, Aid? Yeah, I think absolutely spot on. <clears throat> I think com- communication is the key for us, um, particularly of the pandemic. We've had a huge increase in volume of inquiries and trying to get through them and find the, the ones where we can add value and, and really sell our proposition to the client um, is the key for us. Um, so it really, really just boil down to, I think, talking with us, um, you know, giving a fair presentation of the risk. Um, and, and I guess effectively getting your inquiry to the top of the pile so that we can actually do something, uh, do something for you and your customers. I yeah, think that's I think... quite, sorry, Francis, I was just about to say, I think that's a really good point. This this um, volume of, of stuff coming in at you must make it much, much harder. And I think there's a there's a two way process there. Sorry, Francis. No, I was just, was just picking up on, on A's point there, because it's, it's a very good one. One I, I thought about as well, like an old boss of mine you say many years ago, you know, he has a foot of post and the skill is finding the, the one inch worth of decent inquiries in there or inquiries that appeal to us. And I think picking up Rob's theme there of, you know, I think it's particularly important for ecclesiastical as a specialist insurer in this difficult market. There's such a broad range of things that are just being shown to us because there are so many difficulties in the market. Actually identifying the right cases within that foot of post for want of an old fashioned term is, is, is especially important. And the broker's got a huge role to play in that, in, in helping us find, find the right inquiries for us and, and get our attention on those right ones as well. And I suppose the challenge for the brokers are because it's quite a difficult market, there's a, almost a, a, a tendency to go, 
you know, as many places as you can with as much as you can. And that actually is just exacerbating the problem, I think, is what you're saying. That's right. We could end up with two foot of post rather than the withheld one foot of post. Yes, because there are so few outlets that the temptation is just to show it to everybody in the hope that you can find something. Yeah, that's a good yeah, point. It has been unindated and, and, it, and it can be frustrating for underwriters because it does cloud their their ability to get to the, the right cases. Um, you know, we, we seem, see a flood of inquiries that are just not within our remit. They're not within our, our niches, um, you know, and, and we do invest a great amount of time trying to signpost what they are so that actually when they come through the door, they should fit. Um, you know, we should be able to then look at them very seriously and see if there's something that we can, you know, offer something for. With kind of a, a, a dub, you can see from both sides, can't you? Like, I'm really struggling to place this risk. Who do I know? Where can I go? What what should I do? Versus I'm really struggling to get through this two foot of post and you've given me something that's not within our appetite. Therefore, I'm going to ignore it. What's the answer, Rob? One of the first things you can do is pick up the phone to us um, and, and, and talk to us about things. Um, um, every um, every broker will have a key relationship manager they've got with Ecclesiastical. And I'm sure that's the same with many companies. Pick up the phone and just say, is this one that's going to fit your appetite? Um, but also what that does is it opens a bit of dialogue. Um, and so therefore, actually, if you're talking to the salesperson about it, if you're talking to us in the office about it, actually, the presentation is one thing. But as Aid mentioned earlier, communication is absolutely key. So it's not just about sending a presentation through and sitting there and waiting to see what happens. Actually, the best thing is to do is to get on the phone to the underwriter, get on the phone to the um, key relationship manager and actually explain to them why this is a good risk for ecclesiastical to help make sure yours gets to the top of the pile. And I think that that's probably um, a, a really key function that we've lost a little bit um, whilst we've been obsessing about email traffic. Um, sometimes just picking up the phone and talking to us is a is a lot more straightforward for both parties um, and can produce a better result. And I, th I think you're right, Rob. And I think to try and balance that up for, for, you know, for brokers, you know, the ones who do really well and the ones who are successful with us really do concentrate on that. You know, they engage with us early in the process. They, they almost paint a story of, you know, that, that opportunity, that client, why it's a good fit with us. And, and give a wealth of information, um, you know, and, and, and detail around that client. And, you know, that starts the process early. It means that we can then develop those conversations, start to build out our proposition. And it makes a huge difference versus, as you say, just those inquiries that come in on a, a, a blank email or on, on a broker system. And, you know, I, I'm a massive advocate of that. I suppose my biggest request and overarching thing today would be, you know, please just do talk to us um, right in the early stage. So there's two flags that uh, you've just raised, which I'm going to hold on to, Francis. You mm -hmm. go. Yeah, I, I'm smiling here. I must look like the village idiot sat here smiling because I did a little bit of market research, or if I, if I can call it that. I went and asked two of my underwriters, two of my best new business underwriters, what makes a good presentation from them for, for them. And I got two different stories because they're two different guys. Um, one said he likes to see a picture you know a physical picture because that appeals to him the other guy likes to see the detail and but what they both like behind the picture or the detail is a story and they like an explanation of why that risk is is one for us why it's important why they're showing it to us what are the good features about it so you know picking up both rob and aid's point there it's very much about the engagement on the specific risk rather than the actual presentation itself. I think the story is good Sarah, to have, the pitch is good to have. I think also, Sarah, that that's a, a very key point, particularly as what Aidan and France have also mentioned, the sheer volume of inquiries we've got coming through at the moment. Actually, that ability to paint a picture, to explain to the underwriters why this is a good risk for them to spend their time on, um, that there is going to be rewards at it, that the broker does understand what's needed for the client and can explain that through to the underwriter so he can see that progression. He understands what is being asked of him and he knows quite quickly whether he can deliver that or it's going to be one that actually he can't deliver on. So therefore, it's probably best we tell the broker that early and to therefore let them concentrate on some of the other markets. Um, and, um, and that certainly helps us bring down the volume of inquiries so we can then concentrate on ones where actually what the client's looking for and what the broker is looking for is stuff we're confident we can deliver. I think um, I absolutely get where you're coming from here. And the point I was about to make before I even made it, Francis, you nailed it. So <laughs> what I was going to say is um, 
I've heard quite a lot of conversation around uh, and not not specific or, or in relation to ecclesiastical at all, but I've heard quite a lot of conversation around um, people struggling to get the insurer on the phone. So I literally cannot get anyone on the phone to be able to discuss the risk. So there's absolutely been that issue followed by there's a really weird sort of dynamic between relationship, communication, engagement and technology. So you mentioned a broker portal, which in a lot of people's eyes will be, oh, this is the way to get attention because it's a fast, efficient, I'm getting everything I need. Whereas actually that's not what you guys are saying. You're saying mm. there needs to be much more of a, um, a picture painted, a story, mm. almost an emotional engagement as to why this is one for us. That's quite interesting. That's that I find that really interesting. It, it is an interesting observation. And, and like Francis, I did speak with a couple of our development underwriters because, you know, they're the ones at the core face and, and dealing with it day to day. And, you know, they, they did shout out exactly the same. You know, you know, many brokers use um, similar software houses. Um, and, and as a result, their presentations all look quite alike. Um, you know, and, and, and some of those systems just generate yes and no answers. They don't give the detail that perhaps we necessarily need to underwrite particularly complex risks. And, you know, it's, it's very vanilla in some of the information. So whilst they're a great portal in some ways, it needs additional information. It needs to expand on that and, and further breadth in that out because it can be very difficult for, for an underwriter to just truly assess a, a risk, particularly a, a larger, more complex one on, on, a, on a system. I have a question for you. Whose job is it to make the broker portal less vanilla and more able to paint the picture? I think from our point of view is the fact that um, we know what our underwriters um, need in terms of writing risks. So there's a huge onus on insurers um, um, to, uh, to explain that to um, brokers. So when they're designing these portals, actually, they make sure that the content reflects what's going to make our underwriters react um, um, efficiently. So um, I think there's a, a, a huge part on us to make sure, and, and this is maybe part of that, just trying to make sure that we communicate that to brokers so that actually they can see um, that not all of those systems and not all of that email traffic is achieving the result that, that um, they would like it to achieve. I think it's really interesting. I've, I've spoken to a number of companies that have uh, platforms. I spoke to, to one company, uh, it's slightly off topic, but what they've essentially done is they've built um, a plugin or an algorithm or some form of system, essentially, that pulls all the different Lloyd systems together. So you're looking at one dashboard rather than having to go into each different Lloyd system. I thought that was quite an interesting um, concept. I've spoken to a company called ScheMeServe who build uh, scheme portals. M you know, maybe some of these people need to be involved in these type of conversations to really understand what it is the underwriter wants and then to be able to deliver the capability for the broker to be able to give that information. I think it's quite key. Um, one of the uh, other kind of subjective things that I think is quite interesting is the subjectivity of the underwriters that you've just picked up on, on Francis. And yes. that is sort of whether you're, I don't know, people say left or right minded. Are you creative? Are you detailed? Do you want pictures? You know, that's mm. how do you get around that? Well, I, I th maybe some of the things we're talking about are slightly unique to a ecclesiastical in that we're we're a specialist insurer and you, you, you know the certain risks that will will appeal to us so i suppose traditional commercial combined business coming through a platform on a software house presentation you know really doesn't fit us very well at all so you know it's the engagement with the underwriter whatever that may be is is the most important thing and i i think going back to the earlier example of the guy who likes a picture versus the guy who likes the detail i suppose what i'm trying to say is that the broker needs to appeal to the underwriter that he's talking to if you if, if you like you said earlier about insurers uh, not people not brokers not being able to get through to insurers we've had all of our folk working from home full-time ever since we went into lockdown and our phone lines have been open all the time. All of our underwriters have direct dial numbers. We absolutely encourage our brokers to pick up the, the phone to our underwriters. So we're, we're a different kind of business doing a different kind of thing, perhaps, from some of the uh, insurers that you may be describing. I'm actually interviewing uh, Chris uh, with us. 
uh, I think it might even be tomorrow, and we're going to be talking about some of the work you guys did on this specialist versus generalist mm -hmm. and the different kind of broker personas that came out of it. Uh, so I'm quite interested to have that conversation, reflecting back on the kind of stuff that we're talking about here. I think mm. that'd be quite, quite interesting. Mm. Okay, here's a here's a here's a uh, a question for each of you. What is the worst thing you've seen? What is the biggest like? Oh my word! Is that even a presentation? Or the biggest kind of I don't know thing you've seen that's made you wow? That's that's not okay. Type of uh, reaction. I think I think from my point of view, um, a number one that one, one that, that always frustrates me is when we get stuff that's so completely off trade. You, you're just wondering. I mean, we get fleets through on occasion, and and oh, that's just we're not even registered to write fleet insurance. So that, um, but equally, I'd probably turn the question a little bit and say, what's the the, the most regular mistake? Generally speaking, the most regular mistake that I see um, is is an obvious issue. With a presentation whether that be around construction whether that be about claims whether that be around a specific that is obviously going to cause the underwriter to question whether she'd write the risk or not without a clear solution or risk mitigation around it and so therefore they've highlighted the problem to us and whether that's apparent from the construction details they've sent through but they've not then turned around and said however and, and then sometimes there's not a however, and, and we do accept that. Um, but equally, sometimes then on questioning, when you speak to the broker in more detail, actually they will turn around and say, well, actually, that's not a problem anymore because they're not in that location anymore or they've changed their processes. But quite often we don't get that level of detail. And so it's almost, a, a, it seems anathema to me um, to turn around and highlight a problem of that size and then not turn around and provide a solution when you want an underwriter to be positive. So that's the, probably the one that I see most regularly. Yeah, I, I probably build on that, Rob. I think one of, one of the things that, that we see, and I think it's on a similar theme, is, is construction in particular is a bit of a, um, a hot topic at the moment, particularly modern methods of, of construction, probably for all parties. Um, you know, we get such a, a variance of, 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 of presentations. We get some brokers who are meeting this and providing all the information we need, which makes a bro an, an underwriter's life easy. But we still get plenty of presentations where the construction isn't either mentioned um, or it's often, often just put down as standard construction when it isn't. And right on the other spectrum, I've had examples recently where a broker has provided us with a 30 plus technical page document and would expect us to read through to ascertain the information we require, which we, we just clearly haven't got the time. So I think the message is for me is just to get that right balance. It is a hot subject. Let's make sure we're getting the right underwriting information at the start that we need. You know, and if there's any doubt around that, you know, to pick up, keep coming back to comms, don't we? But pick up the phone, talk to the underwriter. What is it and the level of detail you want to be able to come up with a, a solution that's, that satisfies all parties? Absolutely. But Francis, have you got anything you want to add? Uh, probably not too much more to, to add other than, because I think Rob and Ada picked up the points I was going to make. Most most common thing is, is around the lack of quality within the presentation. So, you know, I, I can think of, we, we often see property owners' presentations where you've got a you've got a postcode of some insured and it's of standard construction, um, but that that's the sort of proposition that's been acceptable in the market for uh, for, for many years. It never has been to ecclesiastical. It, it, we you know we 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 will want more. We want to give our best price. We want to we, we want the best information of of course like any any, any insurer. So, but I, th I think those things are beginning to change as things get more and more difficult to place. So it's really all around the quality of the presentation and the quality of the information that, that people are, um, are providing to us. And it's a good point, isn't it? The more information an underwriter has, you know, the more discounts, the more favourable they can look at the risk, which is ultimately what we all want. You know, we want to write it, we want to write it competitively, and we want a good customer outcome. And if we can get the more information, the, the easier that makes our life. Sometimes it can be seen to a barrier to trade, but it isn't anything other than trying to get the right outcome for the customer, ultimately. What do you think the reason or reasons are um, for either the lack of information or the lack of um, uh, focus on a large amount of information that's provided? Is it um, not understanding what's needed? Is it not understanding the risk? And I know I'm being very general here, but you know, if you're seeing this type of... Uh, not enough info come quite a lot why and then obviously you you have the conversations 
why why where's it coming from that where's the, the piece in the chain that hasn't quite linked quite often um it's um the brokers are under a huge amount of pressure in terms of time scales sometimes they haven't had um the chance to have that in-depth conversation with the client um but sometimes they've inherited the risk from one of their other colleagues who may have left and therefore actually there's big gaps um in some of the risk knowledge that they have um and so therefore there's a variety of reasons and, and sometimes, actually, they just don't appreciate quite the importance of that information to somebody like us. Um, and again, each insurer will have slightly different quirks in terms of what they are particularly looking for and what they're particularly concerned about. But um, and I think that can be um, that can be dealt with in the individual communications with different insurers. The, the, the ones that I'm more concerned about is those big picture ones that Aid mentioned about. Hey, look, if you're going to put a property risk to us, tell us what it's made of, tell us where it is, tell us what the claims experience looks like, um, and tell us how they manage that risk. Um, and um, and that would be a great advantage to us. So again, you know, there is a number of boxes, particularly when you're putting down the level of capacity that it, um, the ecclesiastical put down. Now, if you're putting down 150 million on a risk, actually, there's a number of questions that you'll need the answers to. It may well even be that the internal underwriter has to refer to one of his colleagues within our organisation as well to get certain sign off on things and again he won't be doing that unless he's got a breadth of information so that that senior underwriter can make those decisions so again um, there's many reasons why but it all comes down to the same thing really we're trying to make a rich risk judgment and actually with half the information it does mean that what underwriters do is unfortunately step back a little bit if they're uncertain um, and so therefore that will be not providing terms or not providing competitive terms without that certainty. The more certain and confident you can make an underwriter, the more they're prepared to push that rate, push those covers and, um, and, and give a little bit wider and breadth of cover because they're comfortable with the risk. It's a great point, though, isn't it? Because we have talked so far about the underwriting information and, you know, the, the requirement for that. But that thing you mentioned and referenced about managing risk is equally as important because, you know, we can see what the risk is presented, but actually getting under the skin of what the client's doing, how they're mitigating losses, if there has been one in the past, is hugely helpful and gives the underwriter confidence as well. You know, the more confidence they've got, the more they're going to go out of their way to, to, to put something in terms of uh, an offering on the table that, that, that's comfortable for everybody. The other, the other one I'd probably point out, and this will probably resonate with the other guys, is give us some time. Yeah. Give us some yeah. time to have a look at the thing. Um, um, you know, coming up with a thing on a Friday and saying, by the way, I'm going to see the client on a Monday. Um, uh, it's just not feasible for us to do a proper job on that. Um, and more than often, when you've got the, the, the volume of inquiries we've got in front of us, unfortunately, those risks, if you haven't got enough time to look at them, you'll just have to push them to the side and concentrate on one of the ones that's given you a little bit more of a reasonable um, lead in time so you can make sure not only that you can underwrite the risk properly but the ecclesiastical proposition is much wider than just a pricing and cover thing and so therefore what we're looking to try and do is also turn around and say what else in terms of our services could apply for this client and if we haven't got a chance to have a decent conversation around the client needs then actually the chance of us converting are a lot less and our enthusiasm to write that risk is a lot less. You're right. If I look back and I think about, you know, where our successes have been in the last 12, 18 months, there have been ones where we've got great leading time. We've, we can explore that, that, that information seeking um, uh, kind of view. Um, we can talk about what the proposition is. And it just makes for a whole better experience, I have to say. It, it would be my biggest ask would be time. True pipelining, true identification of cases that we know fit within our niche. We know that there's a desire on the broker and the customer and the underwriter's part to try and progress it. And let's just get our heads together and just let's work out how we make this happen. And, you know, our strike rates and our quoted rates go off the scale when we've got that, when, we've, when, we, when we're gifted that by brokers. I think time is a really difficult one because we've touched on how sort of pushed for time you guys are and how pushed for time brokers are at the moment. And I've certainly had conversations in the past where the problem with time is that the renewal terms haven't come in in time. So you're then working against a really tight level because your renewal terms have come in despite chasing for weeks and weeks and weeks, which gives you maybe two weeks to turn a full market exercise around. And that, you know, the, the broker's then up against it in quite a significant way. So there's a, there's almost a two way thing going on here, isn't there? You can't, you can't, you need the renewal terms really to start to, to, to know where you're at. 
I think what you can do, though, I think when quite often brokers are still very good at actually at meeting their clients and reasonable time scales and just understanding the breadth of the, the exercise that they're going to undertake. What is it the client's looking for? Are they looking to just renew with the existing if you can come up with half reasonable terms? Are they looking for different solutions? Are they comfortable with their existing insurer? And so therefore, actually, you can probably get a reasonably early heads up on whether you think there's a the necessity for a market exercise or not. And equally, you can then pick up the phone to um, an insurer and say, if I was to come to the market, is this the sort of thing that you'd be interested in? Um, we've always got the benefit of last year's or the year before's presentation, actually, to send to somebody, particularly somebody you've built a bit of a relationship with, to turn around and say, look, I know you're great at heritage risks. Can I let you have a quick look at this one? We've not decided exactly what's happening yet, but just give us your initial thoughts. And actually, despite the fact that we are very, very busy, giving initial thoughts on something that we think, yes, if that's coming to market, we'd really like to have a look at that, is something that we do quite well with our partner brokers quite early out as part of that pipelining um, um, proposition that, that um, A talked about. Um, it does help us highlight them. And sometimes there is some internal discussions that we have to have as well. And so therefore what that does is it allows us to have that discussion internally. We've just been talking about one that's um, not due till um, February next year, um, just before this meeting, just so we can then turn around and overcome some of those issues with that risk that we know are going to crop up so that we can then go back to the broker and say, we're happy with that. We know we can roughly be about the number you've talked about. We haven't even got a full presentation in yet, but actually we've been able to do a little bit of digging about what we know about the risk from previously to, to paint a picture for the the. Um, um, broker so that actually they have some reassurance that should the terms come out or the client be particularly keen on moving actually we've done a lot of the legwork up front so uh, that comes right back to comms again so we're talking about time but it, it's it's relationships it's it's communication it's being very transparent through the whole process uh, and and there's a there's a definitely a two-way benefit to that one of the things that you just said which i find interesting so we're doing quite a lot of work with um a broker at the moment who have a number of different businesses within sort of financial services. And one of the things that we're talking about is having conversations about um, additional products outside of the renewal cycle to keep those kind of touch points and conversations all the way through the year. And another thing that I found really interesting in some of the conversations I've been having is is this idea, I don't know if you saw in the news, uh, company Superscript have, have um, uh, joined with Amazon Business and they are the insurance provider for SMEs in Amazon Business. And what I, when I, I did a, a podcast with Henry and what he was saying, which I thought was really interesting, was that they're basically pulling all the details from Amazon, from their accounting provider, and they've got access to all that information about the client. So you've got the ability to be able to go and say, look, you've just employed 10 new people or you've just acquired a new um, asset. Therefore, there's a direct let's have that conversation now. And that type of continual awareness and touch points is, is invaluable. And that's really what we're talking about here, isn't it? Yeah, I think particularly we do that um, 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 on a regular basis for our key accounts. And I think the brokers do the same thing for their key accounts. It won't be just a one off annual visit, there will be touch points within that where they can flag needs to us. And, and part of that regular dialogue with insurer partners should involve that renewal, you know, those key cases, what's happening with those key cases, what other services can we provide to try and help so that actually when we get to renewal, um, the client's happy that not only we've provided the insurance cover and the, the risk transfer, but actually we've helped them manage the risks throughout their business um, to try and mitigate them. Um, well before the renewal comes up. Mm. I think it's really helpful. So if I was to sum up what I think we've said, time and communication, pick up the damn phone and do it early, essentially. That Absolutely. might be the title for this podcast, <laughs> pick up the damn phone and do it early. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything either of you would like to add? Any any kind of shout outs for stuff Ecclesiastical are doing? Any Any special lines you want to promote? Anything you want to shout out before we close off? Keep an eye on the heritage right market from my point of view. Um, keep an eye on that heritage market. It is um, at the moment, we know that a lot of the insurers are struggling to provide um, the capacity on some of those more challenging risks. Um, it, it's, it's a major part of what ecclesiastical do. So if you're struggling with any of those, um, pick up the phone and we'll see if we can help. 
I think my, my, my message is just, you know, to everybody, we're open for business. You know, we, we've got a huge appetite to grow our book. Um, you know, we, we're, we're delivering a good service. We've, as Francis said, we've retained, you know, our team's working from home. They're hybrid working now, but they're all accessible. They're all available to talk about opportunities. Um, most people have got a relationship manager. Just please talk with us. We, you know, we're keen to develop and find those opportunities that we don't know about yet. Francis? Yeah, great capacity, great capability and great people to deliver it. So we're a good organisation. Wonderful. Guys, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm.